In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> We've now reached the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany, and as we have been progressing through these Sundays, the theme of Epiphany continues in that we are, one, we are seeing unfolding the manifestation of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior of the world. And just for a reminder of where we are, on the first Sunday after the Epiphany, we celebrated and remembered Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River and his anointing with the Holy Spirit. And then the next two weeks, we've heard stories of Jesus' calling of his first disciples as he begins this ministry. And now today we get the first story of what his ministry is actually doing. The story is Jesus <clears throat> it goes into Capernaum, which is where he, he in, seems to set up his home base and to live now. Goes into Capernaum and on the Sabbath goes into the synagogue to teach. And we're told <clears throat> that he created a sensation because as Mark says, he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. <clears throat> now that may seem a little strange to us, trying to figure out what that meant. So Mark never tells us. However, if we look in another gospel, for example, Matthew, you see <clears throat> some of that teaching, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus would say things such as, you have heard it says that you said that you should Love your friends and hate your enemies, but I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those, etc. So this is authority, and they would be saying, where does he get this authority to say, but I say? <clears throat> Very strange. As, Matt, <clears throat> as Mark is telling this story today, though, he follows it up with the first of the healing stories. And in this one, we hear the story of a man who has an unclean spirit, that is an ungodly spirit within him, and Jesus performs an exor exorcism. Now, I think the primary, Mark's primary purpose in including this story right here is to demonstrate that not only did Jesus teach as someone who had authority, but he actually had the authority. In other words, what we're told is while the people in the synagogue didn't recognize who he was, and certainly throughout the gospel we have this story of the, the powers that be, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the like, not recognizing Jesus, not recognizing his authority as Messiah. We have this story of immediately we have an unclean spirit who recognizes his authority and obeys it. And this is the astounding thing at the end that makes his, his uh, fame spread. What is this? A new teaching? With authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. <clears throat> now, as far as that goes, it's a pretty straightforward teaching to the beginning of the gospel. And yet this causes us a lot of trouble today. Because this is not the way we see the world anymore. We don't see the world as being populated by uh, spirits clean and uns unclean. We don't see illnesses coming from possession by unclean or ungodly spirits. It bothers us because we now live in a different kind of world. When we see illness, we expect that there is some kind of a of a measurable cause, whether, whether it is psychological or uh, physical or you know, caused by a virus or a whatever. We don't think in those terms. There's actually a long history of how we got to this point. And what it's done to us is what I want to talk about today. The Gospels are filled with these stories of Jesus acting with authority and power as he proclaims the good news of God's kingdom entering the world. And in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, we hear that continue, that Jesus' disciples who followed him after his resurrection and ascension were doing these same acts of authority and power. But then over the centuries after that, they seem to disappear. 
And there have been various interpretations. Probably the most popular through the Middle Ages was that it was a one-time dispensation, that uh, all these miracles occurred to get people's attention and so that they'd know who Jesus was. And now that we're all Christian, we don't need him anymore and they don't show up, which seems a little strange. But that was sort of how the Middle e- medieval church was arguing, was that, well, you know, it is what it is, and the day, age of miracles is over, and everything else will come after you die. That's basically what they said. Not a lot of hope there. But then, of course, after the, after the Enlightenment, which was around 1800 or so when, when scientific learning really took off, we came to see the world in a very different way, that <clears throat> the things that we had ascribed to spirits and unseen forces could be measured. You know, Isaac Newton came up with the, with the theory of gravity and the laws of motion, etc. <clears throat> and everything that previously we couldn't explain and thought it was the hand of God moving, we could explain and knew what happened. And this caused a, another problem because as science began to grow, it could explain some things but couldn't explain others. And some of the scientists and theologians made a very bad decision. When they couldn't explain something, they would say, ah, that's God. <clears throat> when they could, then it, you know, it was, there was a scientific explanation. Well, of course, what happened is over time, science could explain almost everything, and God didn't have a role anymore which led to a pretty empty gospel where God can't really do anything. What really happened after some period of time in, after the Enlightenment was the gospel was really pared down to simple, simply moral teaching. Right? God was, Jesus was this great moral exemplar who showed us the right way to live, and our problem is we're terrible sinners and we're not doing it well enough. And it was a pretty... Well, put it this way, here I am preaching to you. But if we use the term preaching in our everyday speech, it doesn't usually come across as, as proclamation of the gospel. It comes across as moralizing. If you say, he was really preaching to me, it meant he was moralizing. He was telling me I was doing something wrong. And that basically became what the gospel was. Then, of course, by the time we got to the 20th century, we really thought we had grown beyond these kind of superstitions. One of the great theologians of the 20th century was a man named, named Rudolf Bultmann. And Bultmann said what we have to do to recover faith is to demythologize the Bible. So what he meant by that was basically going in and everything that could not be explained scientifically was this is a myth and we're going to throw it out. And, for example, the story we hear today is unexplainable by science, and therefore it's thrown out, which left almost nothing left of the gospel. So that by the time we come to today, what we see in terms of people's thinking about what church is about is it's either about moralizing, i.e. teaching us how to behave and, that, and haranguing us because we're not behaving well enough, or like we're some kind of a social service agency, not too different from the Rotary Club or something else whose job is to go out and you know, do a few good charitable things like collect cans, canned goods to give to the poor or whatever. What's missing is any kind of power or authority. It's all gone. And I think in any one sense we would have to say that's not real attractive because, you know, we could join the Rotary Club and we don't particularly like to have people moralizing to us anyway. Why bother to come to church? But there is something going on. If we can get past Rudolf Bultmann, who, he was a long time ago, his famous quote was, here in the age of the electric light bulb, how can we continue to believe these things? Okay, so that's like 100, over 100 years ago. I wonder what Bultmann would think of today's world. But anyway, we are in a time where it's important. For one thing, we have learned the limits of what science can do. 
which perhaps they didn't know 100 years ago. But we know science has limits. There are things it can't explain and never will. Nor would we ever say that <clears throat> there is nothing to a spiritual world. What we have in the story today, if we get rid of all our other preconceptions, what we still have to recognize is something happened in that synagogue. Now, whether we can explain it or not, something powerful happened. That a man who was mentally ill and sick was cured. And it came through the person, the authority, and the power of Jesus. And it was, in one way, it had to be real. Because Mark keeps telling us this is happening over and over again. It wasn't an illusion it really happened. Even if we can't explain it, there was power in that synagogue that day. Now Jesus told his disciples that the acts that he did, we would do also as his faithful disciple, that all of the authority and the power that had been given to me, he was handing on to us, the church, to continue this work in the world. Yet for most of us, we have assumed that there is no real power. What I'm here to say is, I believe there is power. That when we come here together to pray, our prayers aren't just some uh, useless talking, something to make us feel better. When the church gathers together, when we work together for God's good, there is power in that. There is power when we pray together, when we focus our spirits with God's spirit for the betterment of the world. There's something real and there's something powerful. Whether we can explain it scientifically, which I can tell you we can't, it is real. Now I can, I can quote things such as there have been some scientific studies like double blind studies of people who are sick and you know you have a control group and nobody prays for them and you have a, a, a uh, experimental group and they're being prayed for and the experimental group does better. I mean we've, we've had some of these things we've actually measured that something is going on but we don't know what it is. Without getting all wrapped up or, or like fundamentalists trying to deny science, we simply need to re recognize that there, there is a spiritual world, that we are part of it. We are not just matter and energy, but we are also spirit. And our spirits, when they are united with God's spirit, can make things happen in the world. We can transform the world. There is power there that we would not otherwise have. I believe that the world is yearning to see a church that accepts its authority from God and acts on it. That doesn't just show up as if Sunday is an hour to do whatever. But that we are focusing our energies towards God. That as we worship God and we bring ourselves together God's power and authority still is coming to us to work in the world, to transform evil, to stand up to it, to raise up good. Not just to transform our lives, but all the world. This is what Jesus began. This was the manifestation of the gospel. It is still there. It was there in that synagogue on Capernaum so long ago. We, as we pray in just a minute, will be doing the same thing, bringing to God the fullness with our spirits of all that we intend. And by joining with God, something powerful will happen. Amen.